Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to Sanger Night. So, this evening, Satya Jyoti and I are going to be jointly presenting a topic, a theme called Mind the Gap. And, um, yeah, it's building on our theme. We've had a theme of the Wheel of Life, uh, and the theme is going to go on to look at the spiral path and the goal of enlightenment. But we've been really focusing on the Wheel of Life, in particular these past few weeks. Um, and we've seen how karmically our actions create our states of mind, and our states of mind create the, we the realms that we live in, the world that we live in. And we're trying to aim for the human state, to dwell in the human state, human realm, which has got a mixture of pleasant and unpleasant experience, and it's, it's got awareness, self-reflexive awareness is possible. And we saw last week the outer um, circle of the Wheel of Life contains a code of how to escape from the Wheel of Life. Daniel talked about this last week. And in particular, um, we focused on the gap, the gap between feeling and craving or and grasping the gap in our experience where we can pause, take a step off the wheel and do something different. So we heard all about this last week. Just refer to my notes, excuse me. Yeah, so the gap is especially important and it, and it takes place between feeling and craving in our experience. It's not, this isn't just an abstract thing on a diagram on a wheel. This is our moment by moment, your moment, moment by moment experience. And the technical term we use for feelings, because feelings is a bit vague, is called Vedana, a Buddhist word called Vedana. And, um, yeah, we, if we're not careful, we, can, uh, we have an impulsive response to our Vedana, to our feelings. And we also saw how we can get from Vedana into thoughts and stories about reality, from Pantra. And we end up living, dwelling inside our stories rather than actually what's happening to us. We can, we can be stuck in our mind, in our thoughts, in our stories. This term for pancha. So I want to look a little bit more about what Vedana is, what Vedana means. And I've got this um, very, very traditional Buddhist list called the Satipatthanas, the, the foundations of mindfulness, the bases of mindfulness. And um, this, is, yeah, this is a list that the Buddha taught his, his disciples. And... There are basically different things that we can become aware of, that we can become mindful of, that we can bring our awareness to. And it begins with the body. We can become aware of our body, mindful of our body, we can, and the sensations taking place within our body. We can become aware and mindful of the kind of flavour. I, I would describe this as flavour of, of our experience. Is it pleasant or is it unpleasant? Or is it boring? Are we kind of just not interested in it? And it's, it's going to fall into one of those three categories, our experience. And then we can also become aware of the contents of our hearts and minds, our inner world, our thoughts and our emotions. We can move from this kind of distracted, unaware thinking to become to kind of more aware, mindful thinking and feeling. And then lastly in this list, we can become aware of reality <coughs> itself. Now, the practice of mindfulness is a danger of becoming a bit self-focused. It's a bit self-focused. And Sangha Akshita has broadened this out to include mindfulness of the world around us and mindfulness of other people. So it's a kind of extended list of the different things that we can become mindful of. So the gap in you know, mindfulness of Vedana and body is particularly important. We're going to be talking about that this evening because you remember it's, it's in relation to Vedana that we can get caught up in the wheel going round and round. And it's at the point that Ve Vedana, becoming aware of our Vedana, that the gap gets introduced. So mindfulness of the body and Veda, these two are really important. They're kind of the, the cornerstone, the basis of, of our mindfulness practice. So how does the, how does the gap work in practice with Veda? So um, I'll just quickly go back. <coughs> Hopefully this is stuff you all know from your practice and experience already, but you can feel, you can become mindful of and feel directly the sensations and um, you can become aware of your impulsive desire to, to grab onto something or to push it away. Um, so, for example, yeah, you can feel you can feel the sensations of anger. For example, you can notice what, it, what you can start to get more and more familiar with that. So, right in the heat of the moment, you can start to become aware more quickly what's happening, and you can pause. You can pause in that gap and not snap or shout or hit out, or lash out. You can do something creative, something skillful. 
And just before this talk started, I noticed I was feeling anxious. I could feel the sensations of, of anxiety in my chest and in my body. And I was, I was getting into some anxious thinking about presenting this evening's topic. And it's because I could notice that, because I was aware, I could pause and kind of unhook from those, think, those stories up a punch of, okay, yeah, let's go back into my body, let's breathe, let's relax, it's going to be okay. So if you, if you, if you practice mindfulness of the body in Vedan, you can start to notice the states developing and remove yourself from the stories and the thinking and back into the experience of your body in the Vedana. And we're going to be exploring that a bit this evening. But yeah, as I mentioned, it's, it's, it, what's especially dangerous is Papancha and the stories. We get lost in our, in our thoughts. And this leads to conflict we heard last week. So in a way, we, can, we need to have this base of mindfulness of the body and of Vedana. And then we can move from that to become more aware of our thoughts and, and feelings. But if, we're not, if we don't have this as a base, so often what happens is we're just kind of caught up in this, we're, we're living the stories and the emotions unaware of them. So this is a really important base, mindfulness of the body and Vedana. So we're going to explore the mindfulness of breathing practice this evening. Why is a mindfulness of breathing meditation practice crucial to dwelling in the gap, to living in the gap, and to cultivating awareness? Um, it, it ought to be obvious, and, but so often we can kind of lose, maybe fall out of love with the mindfulness of breathing, or it gets a bit stale, so it's really good to, to revisit the principles. Why is this a really, really important meditation practice? Um, so first of all, what I say is well, meditate, what we do in meditation has long-lasting effects. So it's very well, you can practice mindfulness in your day-to-day -day life and you can change habits, but on the meditation cushion it has longer-lasting effects. What you do with your mind in meditation You'll experience this, it can last for hours afterwards or days afterwards, the states that you cultivate. And what we're doing is we're karmically training the mind, you're, you're training your mind to keep coming back to the breath, to come back to what's directly happening in, in the body, in your experience, not and to unhook from the stories, from the papanchas, from that distracted thoughts. We're training the mind not to get lost in emotional in emotions, but to come back to, um, to come back to the body and the breath and to gain a perspective on our, our our experience. So we're returning again and again to the breath, again and again to our experience of the body in Vedana. Um, yeah, hopefully you'll be, you'll be aware from your own experience that practicing the mindfulness of breathing can have the effect of just trying to slow, it seems like it slows things down, you can notice the wheel and the, and the reactions more and more in your day-to-day -day life and it, it seems like it's slowing things down, you can be in the gap more readily. So it's a karmically important practice and um, what Satya Jyoti and I want to do this evening is just kind of share with you some of our own approaches to the mindfulness of breathing, how we work in the mindfulness of breathing meditation. So we're going to do three, in a way, exercises. We're going to each take it in turns. We're going to introduce some ideas about the mindfulness of breathing practice and then just lead you through a short exercise. And we're going to do that, yeah, we're going to alternate and have three exercises. And then later on this evening, you can play about with those. We're going to have a mindfulness, of full-length mindfulness of breathing meditation, and you can take some of those ideas and what you learn in the discussion groups and, and play around with, with your meditation. So we're going, to, we're going to look to begin with as, at the importance of body awareness, which I've mentioned already, how that's a really important base. We're going to look at the importance of the type of effort that you bring to your meditation and to your awareness. And then we're going to look at how to work with Vedana and to enjoy, enjoy the practice. So. Great. Okay. So I'm just going to say a few words about um, body awareness and then we'll do a sh very short uh, practice of bringing awareness to our breathing. So um, I was thinking today that the spiritual life can in many ways be seen as becoming more aware of what is actually going on of what reality is, rather than our ideas about it. And that's certainly been my experience of, um, the of doing the mindfulness of breathing, that um, more and more it's about really being able to be receptive to what my actual experience of the sensations of breathing are, rather than ideas I might have about it. And um, so we have lots of stories and ideas about our experience quite often, but then if we stop and we pay attention to what's actually happening, it can often be something a little bit different than we thought it might be. So I thought I'd just start with um, a little classic thing, which is if you all just wriggle your feet. So wriggle your toes. And just pay awareness 
Even Vadana has to win his toes. <laughs> so have awareness of what's going on in your toes. Okay, so there are two ways, at least I imagine, that we can experience that. One is we can think about our feet. We can think about them and we can think, oh, I'm wriggling my toes. The other is we actually experience the sensations as they really are when we wriggle our toes. So do you want to have another go and see if there's a difference? Anybody notice a difference? That's quite enjoyable, isn't it? That's my experience. <laughs> yeah. It's more enjoyable than that, my idea of what it would be like. To wriggle your toes. Yeah, that's not very really interesting. Yeah. So I think that's the difference to me. It's a bit this the idea we can always be like in our heads looking down on this body, which we're kind of a bit alienated from, a bit removed from, or we can actually be in our body and um, really experiencing all the different sensations that are going on. And that's really true when we're doing the mindfulness of breathing. So what we're going to do now is just do a, um, a little exercise to explore that a little bit more. So if you just get yourselves comfortable, we're only going to sit, I think, for about five minutes, something like that. It might go as far as six or seven, but it's not going to be any more than that. And um, if you're comfortable when you're, cu when you're sitting, you can just close your eyes or look down at the ground in front of you. Maybe take a couple of deep breaths, letting go of any tension on the out breath. So letting go of tension in your mind and your body so that you can be as present as you can be here in the room, sitting on your chair, sitting on your cushion. And just becoming aware of any noises that you can hear. Having a sense of yourself sitting on your cushion or on your chair. The contact of your sitting bones, the contact of your feet. And letting go into that contact. What I'm going to do now is just lead us through um, some awareness exercises which are based on some yoga exercises. But it's very, what we're doing is we're just allowing our breath to be as it is. We're not trying to change our breath at all. So just having a sense of the whole of the breath. The rise and fall of your chest. Breath coming into your body, going out of your body. Allowing your breath just to be as it is. And then becoming aware of the area around your diaphragm, your belly. Resting your awareness in that area and in the sensations around your diaphragm. Allowing it just to move naturally. Just a sense of the movement, the, what you can experience. As your breath comes in and out. And now, bringing your experience to your ribs the side of your ribs, maybe to your back as well, the sense of the rib cage moving up and down, in and out. What sensations can you notice? What is your actual experience? As 
usual, if you're distracted, you just come back into your body, into what you're actually experiencing. Bringing your awareness a bit higher in the body now, so around your chest, your collarbones. Might be a bit more subtle, the movements now. Just experiencing the sensations as you breathe. Notice any sensations in your throat, inside your mouth, as the breath is passing through. Then up to your nostrils, maybe your upper lip, wherever it is that you have the experience of the breath coming in and going out. What are the sensations you're experiencing there? out your awareness to the whole of the breath, noticing the sensations, what are the sensations you're experiencing now? Stay with the whole of the breath for a minute or two, and then I'll ring the bell to finish. over to Bodhi Nanga. There'll be an opportunity in discussion groups after this to talk about how you find these things, kind of share experience and um, give feedback as well. Feedback would be helpful, but um, for now we're just going to try the next exercise and then the next one and then you have a chance to talk about it. So the thing I want to talk about is um, the kind of effort we make in the mindfulness of breathing is really, really important. So Satyaraja, who's kind of my the meditation teacher I've got the most confidence in, he visited Sheffield recently, he said, well, most people are making the wrong kind of effort in meditation. He described it as too coarse, the effort is too coarse. And by, by which I, I understand too rough, too heavy-handed, maybe too busy, too restless and anxious, too forced. 
So we can try too hard in the meditation, we can try too hard, we can also try not enough as well, so this is important to say, but we can try too hard. And this can fit in with the rest of our life. We lead very active, busy lives. We're rushing around, trying to complete the next task. Um, and we can approach meditation with the same kind of busy mind that we're trying to, this is a task to complete, um, to tick off the list. This is a chore, this is, and um, this is something we have to, yeah, a task we have to complete. So we can bring the wrong kind of energy. Um, now, can you pass me my pen? It's not to do thank you. So I was on a retreat with Vasantra, and he tried to do, um, get across the idea of different types of effort we can make by holding a pen. So he said you can hold a pen, and this is like trying to hold your um, awareness, how tightly you hold your awareness in meditation. He said you can really grip a pen really, really tightly. And it's kind of unnecessary, it's a bit of a, it's overkill really, he said. And what you can try and do is just see how relaxed your hand can become and your arm can become while still holding on to the pen. And there's going to come a point where you get so relaxed that you kind of drop the pen, but it gets more and more relaxed and I'm still holding on to the pen. And then eventually there's a point where I'm too relaxed and the, and the pen is gone. And it's a bit like that with our awareness of, of breathing. We can be really, really tightly focused on, on the breathing or we can really, really relax. But then we get so relaxed that we just lose it. We've lost the breathing and we're kind of lost in distraction. So there's a kind of sweet spot where you can find where you're really relaxed and you're alert. And then you go to, you know, and it's going to, it's going to be different from person to person and maybe from meditation to meditation. So you have to kind of play with um, how, how lightly or how much effort to make in meditation how, and how relaxed you need to be. So it's something to, to play with. Um, and in a minute I'm going to do an exercise that you can play with, but it's probably something to play with over a series of meditations or a whole meditation, just to get a feel for. And I think the word concentration is misleading, because it evokes for me, and we talk about getting concentrated in meditation, but for me it evokes being at school where my mind was distracted and bored and didn't want to follow it, and I had to concentrate, I had to kind of force my mind to, to concentrate. And that's the, not what we're trying to do in the mindfulness of breathing, that's not the kind of effort we're trying to bring. Um, and really concentrated means, in this context, undiluted. It means um, neat, pure, so not diluted. So a mind that is flowing together, unified, not distracted. Not this kind of forced concentration from school. Um, so I prefer the word absorbed when we become absorbed in our experience. And this is a more helpful word for me. So um, you can think of times when you get absorbed, maybe when you're watching a sunset, you can be absorbed in that experience, absorbed in a piece of music, absorbed in a film maybe. So you're really fully present, really with it, and kind of in a way not really separate from the experience either. So there's another point I want to make in relation to the kind of effort we make and the kind of focus we bring, which is that... Um, you can either bring a narrow focus, which is just exclusively on the breath, or you can have a quite a broad spectrum of awareness, which includes um, anyway, lots of the other things that are happening in this list. And again, it's going to vary from meditation to meditation or person to person, which, which, which is the, the appropriate kind of focus you need to bring. But I, again, I heard Satyaraja on a retreat years and years and years ago say, well, really, the Tibetans teach that you only need 25% of your attention on the breath and the other three quarters of your attention is on the rest of your experience. And what I think I've been trying to do in the mindfulness of breathing is just kind of exclude everything else apart from breathing, from my awareness, trying to kind of push it out and only be aware of breathing. But the aim of the practice is to continuously be aware of your breathing, continuously experience your breathing, but at the same time, um, you can do that in a kind of narrow way, in a kind of forced way, or you can do that in a more relaxed way, in a more kind of broad way. Um, and again, there's going to be a sweet spot, you can play with this, and think, okay, well, how much do I include in my awareness before I lose, I lose the breath and I'm not, not following the breath anymore? Or, um, and I'm going to, this is something I'm, we're going to play with in a minute. But for me, what I find is that the kind of, again, I, when I'm too narrow and too forced, my mind doesn't like it. And it's, we, we have this analogy of holding a bird when we teach the intro course. And it's like my mind gets a bit um, shaken up if I'm too kind of, my grip on it is too tight. And um, it's almost like I have to look at the breathing out of the corner of my eye. I'm kind of, I'm based in my body. I'm aware of the sounds of the people, the context. And then I just out of the corner of my eye, oh yeah, I'm breathing. And I can kind of follow the breathing and stay with it. And I found that like if I turn and look directly at the breathing, 
my mind gets more anxious and I kind of start to try and control the breathing or something, it's like overkill. So for me, that's how I approach it. And it, that might not work for you, but just um, the idea out the corner of my eye, I kind of glance at my breathing and kind of, um, yeah, I can, I can manage to stay with my breath and with lots of other things as well. It's much more enjoyable for me, I, I, yeah. So we're going to do an experiment, just kind of, yeah, an experiment with that. Okay. So we'll do that now. So again, if you um, yeah, get into a comfortable meditation position, and see if you can get back into that space that we were just in with such agility, where you were in your body, very much feeling the sensations in your body, not thinking about it, just inhabiting your body. Just anywhere where there's feelings and sensations in your body. For me, I usually like to go into the belly, of a sense I'm inhabiting the belly, breathing there, breathing from there. But then, what I'd like you to do is just kind of is to expand your awareness to include more things, whilst also being aware of the breath. See if you can stay with the experiences of breathing. Now see if you can just be if you can be aware of the whole of your body as well as the breathing sensations. feet, chest and hands, Expand out to include the other people in the room that are breathing as well. Maybe you can hear them, you have a sense of them. And noises outside, distant cars. See if you can hold all of that in your awareness and still be with the breath, the experiences of breathing. the sense that you're looking at the breath from the corner of your eye, if that's helpful. I'd like you to spend a few minutes doing the opposite of that, just to really <coughs> narrowly focus on the experience of breathing in your body, wherever that is, your chest, your tummy, wherever it's most strong, just see if you can be aware of that. Try and make a lot of effort to be really aware of that. 
and not get distracted from it. You might have a sense of being very close, upright close to the breath rather than looking at it from a distance. And now begin to broaden your awareness out again to include the whole of your body and the sounds from outside again. Just in the remaining minutes, just see if there's a balance that is right for you. So as Bodhi Naga said, there'll be a chance for groups to um, talk about how you found doing these exercises. Um, we also invite you to um, maybe during the tea break, during the groups, during the tea break, to maybe every now and then think, oh, what is going on for me at the moment? What is my experience of my breathing? Um, and what is my Vedana, which is the next thing that I'm going to talk about. So Vedana is one of those words that it's best to use the... Um, the Buddhist word, because it describes something that we don't really have an English word for. It's the fact that it's the way that once we've actually come into contact with something in our experience, we very quickly go into whether we like it, we want more of it, we dislike it, so we push it away, or we're just, it's a bit boring, so we don't want to have anything to do with it. And if we're not careful, that can drive our lives. So basically, we can unconsciously be kept, you know, coming across, oh, I like that person, I want to spend time with them. I, dis I, I find the, I have unpleasant Vedana when I see that person, so I'm not going to spend any time with them. 
and just it, for instance, and it will drive us because we don't have any consciousness of it. So I think a really important part of the Buddhist path is bringing our Vedana into our consciousness as much as we can. It's a way of really having much more, um, well, I think we use that phrase in the Newcomer's Course of being like the boss of our own lives, that we can have more, make more of a decision about what we want to be responding to in certain ways. So Vedana can be pleasant, unpleasant, or boring. And I'm going to uh, concentrate on the pleasant, but I just wanted to say a little bit about the unpleasant first. So when I started meditating, when I was taught meditation, I avoided the mindfulness of breathing as much as I could for several years. And the reason was that when I breathed, if that's the, that's the part yet, when I breathed, I um, had really uncomfortable uh, sensations in my ribs. So presumably I'd always had those uncomfortable sensations in my ribs, I just wasn't consciousness, conscious of them until I started bringing awareness into them. And it was, you know, unpleasant, I didn't want to experience that. So whenever I could, I'd sneak off and kind of do the meta bath, because <laughs> I found that different. But um, that can be an experience for many of us, that we might hold tension in our bodies, and that we might experience that tension, bring it into awareness when we start uh, doing the mindfulness of breathing. Or it might be that we've been sitting for quite a while and we've got like discomfort in our legs, our knees, our hips, something like that. Or it might be, you know, that we are living with an injury or an illness that means we do experience pain in our bodies. So my experience of the, um, this discomfort and having pain is, um, well, on one level, when I'm sitting in meditation, if I can kindly bring a gentle awareness to their sensations, it's really interesting what happens. So if you do experience discomfort, maybe not severe pain, I don't think you can do this with, I can't do this with severe pain, but discomfort, just bring an awareness to it and see what's going on. Does it change? Somehow bringing awareness to discomfort, I find it can even dissolve away. It's quite magical the way it can just dissolve away. And by not bringing it into my awareness and getting kind of all um, uptight around it, I can actually make the discomfort and the pain worse. So there's something about very gently moving towards my discomfort that really helps. But of course, it's also really important to look at like your posture, um, how, you know, what you're doing in your life, are you exercising enough, why have you got so much tension? There might be external things you can do as well. I don't think sitting with pain for the sake of it is a good thing, but of course we're all going to um, experience unpleasant Vedana. And I've just found there's something really helpful in my life to be able to go when I find myself, you know, in an uncomfortable situation, to just think, oh, unpleasant Vedana. That's all it is, unpleasant Vedana. I don't need to get caught up in it too much. I can just think, it's unpleasant Vedana, and it will pass. So, let's move on to pleasant Vedana. So there's a phrase, a happy mind is a concentrated mind, a concentrated mind is a happy mind. And this is using concentrated, not in the way uh, that Bojanaga talked about, which is like, we're going to work, concentrate really hard on our exams or whatever. It's this, like, being absorbed. And as an absorbed mind is a happy mind. Um, yes, a happy mind is an absorbed mind. And we'll know that when our mind is not absorbed, actually, when we're flitting around from something to something, that is not a happy state either. So, um, hopefully, when we sit in meditation, we do experience some pleasure. And that's a really good thing. So I think I also came with a little bit of a kind of unconscious Puritan attitude to meditation, which was that, you know, it wasn't about having pleasant experiences. It was about kind of working hard or something like that. But um, no wonder I didn't want to do the mindfulness of breathing. Um, because pleasure in meditation is really good. Of course, if all you want to do is experience the pleasure, that's another side of it. There's always a balance, isn't there? There's a, a balance which is experience pleasure is good. If all you want to do is sit in kind of bliss and never do anything else, well, that's not helpful either. It's finding the balance. But for many people, actually just having that experience of pleasure um, is something that we have to allow ourselves to do. And if we're experiencing pleasure when we do the mindfulness of breathing, well, we're more likely to meditate, which is a really good thing. And um, we're more likely to experience high, higher states of consciousness, more focused, aware, absorbed states. That kind of, we might find ourselves in first dhyana, which is also that kind of state that people might know as flow. You know, when you're just in, absorbed in what's happening to you, you're just responding really out well. We can experience that inside meditation and outside as well. 
And I think if we can learn how to um, contact that state of mind in meditation, we can do it more out of meditation as well, because we can look for what those experiences are, those pleasurable experiences. And in that pleasurable experience of absorption, um, well, we're not experiencing craving, we're not experiencing ill will. And so our mind is really uh, much more supple, and we can really use that traditionally, that state of pleasure in meditation, is where we might examine the nature of reality. So um, that's where we might, we might be thinking about, well, what is the nature of reality? We might actually be meditating and moving towards having more insight into the world, what's traditionally called Vipassana. Um, and that's what the Buddha theoretically was doing, apparently was doing, when he um, achieved enlightenment, he was in that state, what's called first dhyana, that very pleasurable state. And I think it can really turn us around, uh, help us not to look for pleasure so much, craving for pleasure in things outside of us. Last year when I was on a very long retreat, um, there were times when every time I sat down to meditate, I went into really a lot of pleasure. And I thought, wow, people pay a lot of money and they go to a lot of effort to achieve what I'm just getting by just sitting here. Do you know what I mean? It was like, you know, people get themselves in a lot of trouble, actually, to just that kind of, you know. And I just thought, wow, that is quite amazing, isn't it? That we can, human beings, can just experience this pleasure just from sitting down and allowing it to happen. So how do we um, allow ourselves to experience more pleasure? which will help us to want to meditate more. And also it's a very human thing, isn't it? We crave for pleasure. Let's try and move that craving into something that benefits us. So that's us meditating, us becoming more aware and kinder people. So I think one thing is we can try and use beauty to help us. So for instance, we might um, be aware of the beauty in the shrine room when we're meditating. We might actively try and set ourselves up a place to meditate which we find beautiful in our house, where we might have some pictures, we might have some candles, um, we might, if we like incense or something like that, we might burn that so there's a kind of beautiful scent there. So we might actually do things that help allow us to feel more beauty. Um, I was thinking we might um, chant mantras if we find those beautiful. Uh, we find those beautiful. So we might think about the senses, smell, sound, etc. What we find beautiful and we might try and develop more of that as we're um, meditating. We might look for um, senses of pleasure in our body. So we might, we'll do, when I lead us through our exercise, that's what I'll be looking for. So there might be, we might be relaxed, we might feel warmth, we might just feel expansiveness. I think it's quite hard to put some of these things into words, actually. But we can just enjoy that and rest our awareness in any sense of pleasure in our body. If there are mental states that we've got any sense of spaciousness in our mental state, uh, we might just be able to open out into that. Um, we might meditate or reflect on um, how that we've been generous. Um, I think next week we're going to hear more about this, but we might reflect on our ethical behaviour, and that might allow us to move into a more expansive state that allows us to experience more pleasurable sensations in meditation. We could listen, we could read a poem that, that opens us up, read some dharma, puts us in a different mental state, maybe listen to a talk, things that just open us up into a different state of mind. An image that Vidanya used years ago that really spoke to me is the sense that we might sit on our meditation cushion as if it's a throne. And it's like we're taking our place as kind of kings or queens, and we're, um, yeah, somehow we're, um, yeah, just that it's, uh, I suppose, the kind of sense of state and power that you might associate with sitting on a throne. That worked quite well for me. We might imagine that we're meditating in the presence of the Buddha um, or something that's higher than ourselves, a figure that we uh, connect with. Um, we might listen out for sounds that we find beautiful, the rain perhaps on the, on the roof, um, the sounds that we're enjoying. Yeah, so I suppose what I'm trying to really express here is that pleasure in meditation is really helpful to us, pleasurable Vedana, and let's just try and find ways that we can really enjoy our meditation. So let's have a go. <laughs> so if you want to sit again in meditation.
So again, as much as you can, coming back into your body, your breathing, finding that sense of balance between over-focused and um, just broadly distracted, coming right into that balance. And just opening up to any sense of pleasure in your experience. for warmth, relaxation. It might be in the subtlety of your breath around your nostrils. It might be in your belly, rise and fall. might be just a sense of expansiveness that you are experiencing. As your breath comes in and out, allowing any pleasurable Vedana to grow.